yeah, so I'm doing a series of seven talks on the uh, the five Buddha families, the um, five wisdom energies, and where they come into relevance for us as Zen practitioners, as spiritual practitioners, is that we have um, kind of two directions of, of practice, and ideally they come together as one, uh, but often when people come to spiritual practice, they're looking for the vertical aspect of practice, the accessing of peace, space, um, learning how to let go of thoughts. Then there's this other aspect of practice that shows up um, once we come and realize that we can't get away from ourselves, that just coming to sit and meditate um, actually gets brings us closer to the aspects of ourselves that are causing problems in our lives and creating suffering for ourselves and for others. So these, the practice and the, the study of the five wisdom energies gives us a context to do the horizontal work, the emotional, psychological work. I find too that it gives us the insight into others and, and accepting others and others' differences, and then also accepting ourselves for who we are <clears throat> and who we're not and who... And I'll give you an example. So for me, when I came to Zen practice, I really was seeking out Buddha energy, which is what the talk will be about today. And uh, Buddha energy is space, spaciousness, calm, peace. It's just pure awareness without an agenda. My natural energies are the karma energy, which is action and energy, um, um, motivation, activity. And then also Vajra, which is the blue, the clear, the clear insight, the, the distinct, uh, distinguishing things and, and um, the intellectual aspect. And so I needed some space in my life. So I came to Zen practice looking for space. And I had this fantasy that I would become this Buddha type person. So when I think of the Buddha, I think of Buddha as this very calm, peaceful person. And that's what I wanted. And through the course of my practice and training, um, I realized that, um, that my natural way of being in the world is not this sort of just passive, relaxed, calm person. My, my, my natural tendencies are to be active, um, to, to think, to teach, you know, teachers, um, uh, and not just uh, in, in Buddhism, but um, teaching in psychology and outdoor education, mountain guiding, things that I've done in the past. Um, teachers have to have this sharp mind and this way to organize information and make that information presentable and understandable to other people. So these are some of my natural strengths as a Vajra and a karma person, um, as my dominant energies. But I will say that over time in practicing and this is what I, you know, I think a, a lot of us come to, to Zen Buddhist practice for and, and maybe Buddhist practice in general is this need for space because the Buddha energy, which I'll talk about more here in a moment, is, um, is, the, is this antidote to these other neurotic aspects or these other um, wisdom aspects as well, these other energies. So that's a little bit of a... Um, introduction here and actually I just want to give a brief um, uh, recount of the of the first talk that I gave a few weeks ago and so because I will be using this information through the talk so just a reminder the yellow here is Ratna and Ratna the wisdom is typically um, abundance generosity um, welcoming equanimity and the uh, the, the confused aspect where the energy um, twists is um, a feeling of lack, of not enough, needing more and more and more, accumulating, hoarding. Um, yeah, and then karma, green. This is, uh, is um, activity, energy. You have lots of motivation as it, as it manifests with, uh, um, wisely. Um, lots of uh, energy to do things. You accomplish things. Very productive. And the 
uh, neurotic side of that is that it doesn't know how to slow down, doesn't know how to stop, um, and um, can be controlling in, in trying to get the agenda accomplished. And then we have Padma, which is red. And this is the passion, the love, the, the desire for connection, the interpersonal, the joy of interpersonal interaction. Um, and that could be interaction with another human being, could be interaction with things, um, but it's very specific. Like it really wants specific things. So if it's art or food or something, it's got its mind on something. And I was in love with a skateboard back when I was in seventh grade and I couldn't stop thinking about it. As soon as I got it, I slept with it every night for like a week before I used it. Um, the neurotic side of that is, uh, is easily hurt. Um, the feeling of abandonment and um, rejection and um, clinging and uh, can't let go. And then uh, Vajra, the blue, is a sharp insight, uh, cuts through delusion, um, intellectually sharp, um, can take all kinds of information and synthesize and organize information. And then finally, what we're gonna talk about today, the Buddha energy, white. So let me just pull up my notes here. So I want to start us off. Uh, Corin has a bunch of uh, wonderful poems here around and um, sayings here around the Abbey, and uh, she passed one on to me. This is from Li Po, the famous poem, poet. The birds have vanished into the sky, and now the last cloud drains away. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. Stillness. So we dissolve. The self completely dissolves away into stillness. Free. The, the energy of Buddha. Of Buddha. And actually, let me say something about this Buddha energy. So this word Buddha, I don't know when it actually came around. The Buddha is the awakened one. But maybe this term was used before that as awakened ones. But then he became the awakened one. Um, but this energy is the, as it's talked about, um, is the primordial energy of the universe. So scientists, when they look in microscopes, you know, into, into, into matter, ultimately things are primarily made of space. So in, inside an atom, atoms are mostly comprised of space. Inside our bodies, we are mostly space. We look kind of dense and thick and real, but that's just our limited perceptions. Mostly things are just space. So um, it has been called many things and I won't um, go through all the names that this primordial energy has been called, but that's what we're talking about here. And it is the energy that these other energies come out of. So the Ratna, the Karma, the Padma, um, the Vajra come out of Buddha energy as it's taught. So Buddha energy is um, relaxed, soft, clear, calm, at peace, weightless, unbounded, light. Can you feel that right now in this moment? Um, and a visualization or an image that might help you get in touch with this energy is... Um, actually floating out in space. When I watch movies about people floating in space, it just seems so um, still and peaceful. Also floating underwater. When you go underwater and there's that weightlessness and then the sound goes away, there's a peace that people feel. Uh, floating alone out on a lake, a still lake. We're sitting alone in an empty auditorium. So even though there's walls there, there can be this sense of like quiet stillness. 
the way that the energy of of this Buddha energy can become confused or twisted or can sh uh, have a shadow form is when it comes through core beliefs or trauma or fears or just coming through the natural, the having a human body. And it can show up as dull, heavy, foggy, and thick. So people who carry Buddha energy. So each of us has a dominant energy or a, or a couple dominant energies. And then we have our complementary energies. So we all have all five of these. They're always working on every day. But as you think around about friends or family members or people that you know, colleagues, um, you will see that some people carry certain energies much more than others. And then they only access the other energies when they're needed. So they're not, they're kind of like on the shelf until needed and then used versus always there. Okay, so, um, so people who carry Buddha energy, they speak only when necessary. They're non-judgmental. They're disinterested in interpersonal or political drama. They're relaxed. They don't take things personally. They're disarmed, approachable very refreshing for others to be around. They absorb the neuroses and quick of others and dissolve it. There's not a rebound. There's typically not a defense. Now this is someone, this is like pure Buddha energy or almost pure Buddha energy, okay? So again, people are gonna have different energies, but this is just talking from a pure aspect of Buddha energy. Um, they listen without interrupting. And then when the person finishes talking, there's still a pause. Um, they live simply. They typically don't own too many things. Inside their house, there aren't many things. Um, there aren't sort of paintings everywhere and, you know, um, bookshelves full of books or things on, you know, um, there's not a whole lot of accumulation. Um, they are satisfied without having a direction or a purpose. They don't need it. Easy going, grounded. So then when that Buddha energy gets twisted a little or, you know, comes through the, the, uh, uh, the the filter of trauma or fears or um, you know childhood uh, difficulties you know or or uh, or genetics you know um, certain disabilities mental disabilities um, it can it can show up in different ways so it can become spaced out instead of spacious it's spaced out maybe even dissociated checked out not really present. Um, ignorant or ignoring. What environmental crisis? Uh, they can be slow to process information. They can be emotionless. So they might have flat faces without a whole lot of emotional expression on the face. Um, dull. So it, conversations might not go very far. Or when you ask someone questions, they might just have short answers. Um, they can be forgetful. They can have a sense of being lost. Like what, where are we going, huh? Uh, disinterested. And they can actually be a poor listener. So on this side, um, they might be a poor listener. So kind of like they're looking at you, but nothing's really landing. And they can't be bothered. You know, come on, babe, let's go to this rally. Eh, eh. Sluggish, passive. 
you throw in a little Vajra and you get some passive aggressive, but here, just the Buddha energy, passive. On the extreme end, we can have schizoid personality disorder. Um, which is just an extreme version of everything that I'm talking about here. No need for human interaction, like no desire for it at all. You get nothing from it. It can be hard to get motivated, hard to get off the couch, hard to start a task. So not like this anxious procrastination, but just kind of like, eh, don't really want to. Um, this person can be clueless, disconnected, um, lacking purpose. So in the wisdom, there's no need for purpose. But here, um, it can be a person who's just um, lacking direction and purpose and sort of just stumbling through life without any kind of um, um, any kind of career goals or desire for relationship or you know this per the out outside of their house the ch the pain is chipping off the off the the slats and just a couple more here um maybe a fear of leaving the relaxed and dull comfort zone because everything out there requires energy requires me to do something and that just feels utterly painful to have to try to find that in myself to do that. Um, often anger is taught as um, coming from the Vajra, but I find that each energy has its own style of anger. And the Buddha energy is this anger of what I just talked about. Um, when you have to become an adult, you have to do adulting kind of things. When you have to be responsible and you have to get off the couch and do chores or make decisions or um, initiate a task or complete a task. That can, that can bring up a lot of frustration for someone with um, Buddha energy. Okay, so, so we've talked about the sort of wisdom manifestation and the neurotic manifestation of, of Buddha energy. Um, so I wanna talk about relationships. So in relationship, we talked about a little bit, but in relationship, someone who is primarily Buddha energy is probably gonna be drawn towards somebody who's more of a Padma or Ratna energy. Someone who's more emotional, someone who is more active and creative, or maybe a karma, they might be drawn to a karma. Um, so someone who can bring some balance. So, and, and, and vice versa. So if someone is emotional and can't slow down, they need a Buddha in their life. They need some Buddha energy in their life. So they're going to be drawn to someone who's more calm. And these balance, these uh, opposites balance each other out. In work, someone with Buddha energy is probably more drawn to something that's simple. Uh, working on the assembly line. Um, working in an environment where there aren't lots of people that you have to interact with. Um, working at home, you know, online or something is probably a preferred way of working. Teenagers. So in our American culture, we really um, hold high the teenager who's, you know, A plus student, you know, um, captain of the team, um, on the, you know, the, the school president, all this kind of stuff, right? That is not what Buddha energy is interested in, just not interested. So a, a kid who has um, a lot of Buddha energy might not do well in our culture and might not fit all the, the storylines of what people are supposed to do. And they might be more drawn to hanging out, hanging out with friends or, um, uh, you know, watching lots of TV or playing lots of video games or um, sleeping a lot, um, but they, and that's more maybe a neurotic side. And then the positive side is that um, there's someone that everybody likes. Oh, so and so, so chill. You know, they're so chill. Environments. Um, 
so a library. So forget that the books, but when you go into a library, it's quiet, it's silent. And there's this piece that's just there, right? If you've ever been inside the Great Stupa up at the Shambhala Mountain Center, when you go in there, it's just pure silence. It's so quiet in there. An open prairie, an empty auditorium, sailing on the ocean. Um, watching a ballet. So there's different kinds of ballet, but and, and so this will be a mix of energies, but going to a ballet and just watching you know, being in the audience and watching or going and listening to an orchestra. Folding sheets, you know, and not being rushed, just enjoying sitting there folding sheets. So that might be a little bit of Buddha Vajra or Buddha Karma. Skiing powder. And then nature and animals. I just have a few things here. So a sloth. Um, have, if you've ever seen a sloth, they're so cute, but they're, they're totally satisfied just hanging there and they can hang for a long time. Elephants, mountains, trees, the sky. In terms of a time of day, um, for me, the Buddha energy arises early in the morning from like between 2 and 5 a.m. or 2 and 6 a.m., when everything is just at peace, you know, the, the world outside is at peace. It just seems like the energy of the atmosphere inside a building even is just relaxed and it's quiet. And then also in the afternoon, that's where I see more of the, the neurotic aspect come up, sort of like after lunch when everybody feels dull and you'd rather just take a nap, but you're trying to do some work and the mind is just not working very quickly and you feel like you need some caffeine, some karma energy to, to get things rolling. So I wanna talk about pairings a little bit. So like I said, um, each of us has a dominant energy, but often we have a couple. And so someone who is a Buddha Vajra would be uh, like the stories or the myths of our ancient Zen teachers or ancient Zen masters. Um, these really peaceful but clear uh, personas. Philosophers, scientists, architects, nonfiction writers. And then Buddha Ratna. So remember, Ratna is the generosity, the abundance, the, the joy of things and living life to its fullest. Uh, Buddha Ratna might be more like instead of reading at a library, it might be reading at Barnes and Noble, you know, where there's a little more color and there's a little more activity and there's a coffee shop there and you can have your coffee and you can have this full experience. Uh, grandmotherly energy can be Buddha Ratna, it can also be Buddha Padma, but the grandmotherly and grandfatherly energy of just holding space for the toddler or holding space for the youth and just accepting and just being there to hold the space, but then also wanting to give, wanting to offer, oh, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? The Godfather, very uh, Buddha Ratna, very calm, the sense of like peace, but also this sort of wrathful, abundant, taking care of things, you know. Uh, fiction writers, archaeologists, James Earl Jones, and maybe Jesus. Jesus might be either Buddha Ratna or Buddha, Buddha Padma. But Jesus, you know, giving food to all those who needed it and uh, that equanimity of allowing, being there for everybody. Everybody's accepted. That's Ratna. But ultimately having this, this great peace about him that we imagine. And then Buddha Padma, Liv Tyler as uh, Arwen in The Lord of the Rings. Um, just that really peaceful, calm energy, but so loving, you know, so warm. Ama, the, hung, the hugging saint. Um, just open arms for everybody. 
hairdressers, you know? Um, I always fall asleep, at, you know, I don't get haircuts anymore, but when I did, I would always fall asleep. So they're just sitting there doing their thing, you know, not rushing, like just at peace all day, eight hours a day, just at peace, you know, doing their thing. Um, let's see, uh, also psychotherapists might be Buddha Padma, like really empathetic, but also holding space for people. And then I thought of Zen Master EQ who was known to encourage the practice of sexuality, art, and music in the 15th century. Um, yeah, and he, and he hung out in the brothels and he hung out with the artists. He hung out on the streets and he just loved everybody and loved and so detailed in his art and his music. And then finally, Buddha Karma. So in Buddha Karma, I think of athletes you know, like really serious athletes, they have this like, especially endurance athletes, there's just this calm about them um, from so much time spent in that um, runner's high, I guess. And um, athletes have to have this calmness about them to be able to, and Vajra also, but be able to take in everything that's going on and then also be active at the same time and not get overwhelmed by things. I also think of our modern day action stars who are kind of emotionless, you know, like, like there's a big difference between our new 007s and our older 007s. The older 007s were more Ratna and Padma. Our new 007s are sort of emotionally blank uh, and, and, and sort of personality-less in a way, but also just constantly moving in these movies, you know? I also thought of Forrest Gump, you know, Forrest Gump just has a lot of calm peace about him, but he just, he ran for three years, you know. Executive directors hold this Buddha karma energy. They hold a lot. Executive directors or some CEOs hold a lot of space, but they also have to get a lot done. So they have to maintain this calm energy about themselves because people are constantly criticizing and wanting and wanting this and wanting that. And they just have to be space, um, but then also make decisions and get things done. And then finally, I thought of Chewbacca as a Buddha karma. He might be kind of rotten too. Um, and Padma, you know, he, bring, he hugs at times, but he's got a lot of action to him. So working with these energies. So some of you, uh, as you're listening, um, you might find that, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, you might find that you are, are more Buddha energy. Others are like, whoa, that Buddha energy is so not me. <laughs> so not me. Okay, so I'll kind of talk about both of those. So first of all, notice, are you fearful of Buddha energy? So when you think about sitting alone in an auditorium or floating on a float out on a flat lake or um, being out on the prairie alone, is that, oh, so comfortable? Or is that, whoa, scary? Or somewhere in the middle. So generally with working with these energies, we lean into them. It's not about trying to like stuff it down, change it, make it go away. It's really about leaning into it, feeling it, allowing it to, to come into the body and bring our awareness into the sensations of that dullness or that fear of space, and then allowing ourselves to go find it. I have a lot of clients who have really high anxiety and they just keep going, high anxiety plus ADHD. That combo right there, space and being silent still is like way outside of the comfort zone. It's what they want, but as soon as they get a little taste of it, it's like, whoa, that's enough. Let's, let's, let's go do something. So often I encourage them to do yoga or more movement oriented um, uh, 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 practices that access Buddha energy. So in general with Buddha energy, we have to slow down. So we have to slow down and, and sink into it. So even just taking one breath 
can give those of us who are the karma people or something else, you know, Padma or Ratna or Vajra, that we can just get a sense of Buddha energy, a feeling of Buddha energy in just, in just, a, in just a second by just taking a breath. Looking at the stars at night, I'm sure many of you, and, and, and it was true for me when I looked at the stars at night, when I was a kid, it was just, and as an adult too, it's just, whew, the mind just empties. Even in the day, looking at the sky outside can bring that sense of Buddha space. In our meditations, there's so many different kinds of meditations, and this is why some meditations might work really well for some people and not well for others, and why some people might be drawn to Zen and some people are drawn to another form of Buddhism or outside of Buddhism, finding something different. So in Zen, you know, we really are cultivating Buddha energy. That is what we're trying to, uh, we do other things too, but um, a lot of our meditation practices are cultivating Buddha energy and, and getting in touch with it and really making, getting, uh, so that that is the place that we function from naturally, or at least if it's not our, our dominant energies, we have lots of access to it. And so the concentration practices of shamatha or zazen, you know, concentrating on the hara, mu, concentrating on sounds, extending the breath um, longer, and following the breath with the awareness all the way until it ends can bring that sense of peace. Visualizing one's boundaries of self and dissipating. I just have a couple more minutes here and then we'll be finished. Um, more ways to get in touch with this aspect is um, going to a hot springs, a getting a massage, doing body work, um, aromatherapy, acupuncture, doing qigong, um, yin yoga, restorative yoga. And even when we get sick, for me, like I rarely get sick, but when I do, it's such a breath of fresh air for me because I finally just like lay down for two days or a few hours even, and just do nothing and take naps and watch TV and eat popcorn. Uh, so, so for those who are, are, their primary energy is Buddha energy and you're experiencing the confused side of it, um, which you will, I don't think any human being is, is this pure wisdom energy. We've we, we all experienced both. And the more we practice, the more we manifest the wisdom energy and less of the confused, twisted energy. But, but anyway, so working with the twisted energy of Buddha is um, feeling it, um, incorporating the other energy. So learning about Padma. So maybe you need to take your partner out on a date instead of them always taking you out. And you have to kind of push that boundary and get comfortable with getting out of your comfort zone. Um, maybe you need to create a goal to give something that's yours to somebody else or something, just anything, like be generous, like give something to people once a week or once a month. Um, and you might be, you might need to attend emotional and psychological workshops because dealing with your emotional side of things is way outside the comfort zone. If you have if you're a Buddha energy, um, because you're at peace already. Why do I need that? Why do I need to do that? So to conclude here, just a reminder that Buddha energy is the space from which everything else blossoms. The antidote um, to Buddha energy comes from getting in touch with other energies and then also leaning into and feeling the confused form of Buddha energy. And I'll finish with one more poem here by Ryokan. Like the little stream making its way through the mossy crevices, I too quietly turn clear and transparent. Thank you.